and good evening. I'm Ted L. Gunderson, retired senior special agent in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division, 27-year veteran of the FBI in the old days, not the new days. Today is February the 9th, 2006, and you folks had better hold on to your britches because you're going for a real good ride with Bob Fisher. Uh, Bob Fisher is from the East Coast, and Bob, welcome to this Thank you. show, whatever the show is. I'm All not right. sure. All right. Well, but we'll Bob, you have a fantastic background. You have been going over some of the details of uh, your discovery and your research, and I am unbelievably fascinated with what you've come up with. Uh, to begin, uh, Bob, uh, tell me about yourself. Where were you raised? Okay, just a simple guy born in Missouri, St. Louis area of Missouri, and uh, one of 10 kids. Uh, grew up Catholic, obviously. <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> a sexy Protestant, but a Catholic. Right? Catholic, uh, and uh, had, uh, you know, a pretty normal, uh, sane, stable upbringing, and uh, had, uh, at the point of time when I left uh, high school, uh, had my private pilot's license, had that in my senior year. Uh, after I left high school, I had uh, uh, entered into a program to get my airframe and power plant mechanics license for uh, a period of time. I worked for uh, charter aircraft operations uh, doing mechanics. Uh, and then I decided to go back to school and got a background in biology and biochemistry and started working at uh, the University of Missouri at their medical school and the various departments. I had worked in the biochemistry department, pharmacology department, and the pathology departments in the, over a span of about six years. And then uh, got hired by DuPont, uh, came out to the East Coast in 1982, and uh, started in a uh, life science research program that they had for their pharmaceutical division and was with them up until 1997. And uh, so that was es essentially my, the extent of my professional uh, technical background. And, uh, and, and Bob, uh, we've been going over uh, this material that uh, uh, you came uh, to California with. And uh, uh, tell us, uh, how did you come across this information? Uh, how did you develop within your own mind, and uh, how did you come up with this research? Well, um, I sort of like uh, fell into it backwards, <laughs> is the best way to describe it. Uh, after I, my departure from DuPont, uh, one of the, the jobs that I was able to pick up was working for a bank courier service, and uh, some of the assignments were very long distances at night, driving from Wilmington, Delaware to uh, Chase Bank in, in Manhattan, two-hour drive up, up and back. And uh, you just have a lot of time to sit and think, and, and uh, things started coming to me about patterns of numbers, and it wasn't something that I normally would do. I didn't have any real fascination with mathematical puzzles or anything up until that time. I had used mathematics in my job, but uh, just in a utility kind of way, never had any real draw to it. But I guess that there was some sort of influence, uh, external influence on me to, you know, start paying attention to little mathematical details, and I started puzzling it together. And this was about three years prior to 9-11 that this, this uh, began, and, and uh, so I had started to think that, that these uh, bits and pieces may be part of a, uh, uh, a system that would be a mathematical language, and I was approaching it in that direction, thinking that you know this would might be the a, a good basis for a mathematical language. Uh, uh, when 9/11 happened, I thought you know that you know like all Americans that this was a major travesty perpetrated by Al Qaeda and the uh, Muslim extremists in, on America, and, and you know, I only considered it like everybody else did, or most everybody else, I should say. And it Not me. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, I was part of the uh, uh, 
naive masses, if, if you want to call a silent majority, there was a, a naive majority out there as well I was a member of. They're still there. Yeah, well, in any case, they lost one member. Um, at about six months after 9-11, uh, I had begun looking at this from a perspective of some mathematical coincidence, coincidences with what I had observed previously and some friends had actually can encouraged me to look at it further and uh, what emerged was a definite mathematical pattern was was occurring with these attacks and other attacks prior to that there is uh, some uh, indications of a mathematical mathematical pattern starting with the the uh, the bombing of the uh, Kobar Towers in 96 and then uh, the African Embassy bombings in 98 and then the Flight 990 in 1999 and, and the USS Cole uh, the following year in 2000 and then leading up to 2001. And I thought that this was a pattern that the Arabic Muslim people were using as, as part of some greater plan and I investigated and, and uh, put together a, a report that I submitted to the NSA. <laughs> National, <laughs> National Security Agency. Yes, I put it together an 80-page report that uh, they reviewed and uh, appreciated and, and sent me back a letter acknowledging. And, uh, well, that's good. And they At least they acknowledged they received it. And then I, um, they encouraged me to pass it on to other agencies which I passed on to the CIA and uh, one aspect of it pertains to uh, the celestial mechanics and, and uh, ge geophysical uh, parameters of the earth and, and its spin and, and its wobbles and it is the uh, naval observatory that keeps track of such things for keeping things on track for the GPS satellite system. Did the CIA respond? CIA did not respond. Oh, I wonder why. I think that, you know, George Tennant had other things on his plate. In any case, um, thinking that these factors that involve the Earth uh, mechanics might be something that they may be helpful with or they may in, in actually uh, appreciate learning about, I approached the Naval Observatory and uh, had a discussion with the uh, people there for a period of time and then all of a sudden they shut down communication with me altogether. Did you see them physically uh, or just uh, this was by correspondence? This was correspondence by phone and by email. And then, so I have those emails um, on, on disk, so I, I have a record of what that. What was their reaction? Uh, did any, was it positive, negative, or they just quit communicating with you? Well, initially it was amazement and then interest. And then when I started hitting upon things that, you know, corresponded to reality they they pondered it and they got back to me and then after about a week back and forth then they shut it down never they, heard from them again they would not respond to anything okay little did I know that that was in Dick Cheney's backyard <laughs> the you naval physically naval observatory is right. in Dick Cheney's backyard so Dick Cheney being the vice president of the United States of America and uh, of other organizations yes Yes, uh, much uh, more significant organizations. So, um, like a, a lemming, like the rest of us, I, I just uh, was totally in the dark. And uh, it wasn't until about eight months ago that I uh, happened to be driving along one day and tuned on, scanned up and down the aisle, uh, 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 the dial, and found uh, a radio program by, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Alex Jones. Alex Jones, thank you. And I listened to it, and my jaw dropped open, and I realized that I had been a fool. Then it all came together? It, it, after listening to a few of his shows, it, it started to think, sink in that this, this was a reality, and that this was all perpetrated by the peop very people that I was trying to address and bring attention to. And so it uh, the allowed me to understand, too, their behavior and how they interacted with me. Well, their well. behavior certainly uh, uh, accelerated your thinking, though, didn't it? Yes. It also Particularly when you heard Alex Jones. Yes, and it also shut off Good my... Good for you, Alex. We're proud of you. Yes, okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, 
It also shut down my communication with them altogether from my side. I no longer had any interest in speaking with them but ever then, again. <laughs> but then that gave you, you had to figure that gave you credibility then. Well, um, it gave me the impetus to think that, you know, uh, let's look at this and, and see what actually is further in the rabbit hole and how deep it went. And I went deeper and deeper. And uh, I think with the presentation, you'll find just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Okay, uh, do you want to start? Sure. Let's explain uh, what we have here on the screen. Uh, okay. Uh, itinerary uh, coding shells. What does that mean? Okay, that seems Looks like, like a whole series of eggs, uh, one w within the other. That's what it is. Uh, essentially, there are organizations that have, uh, through throughout time, uh, essentially have an agenda that they have been following, and it. It uh, root is rooted back uh, all the way back to the Knights Templar and and their founding and Knights Templar being what? They are the knights that essentially f uh, regarded themselves as uh, uh, the children of or uh, the uh, progeny of Christ, and that they were a part of a, a privileged line of rulers that were intended to rule the world. Okay. Now what year would this have been? That would be, the, the founding of it would have been 1118, and uh, essentially they had uh, uh, put together a uh, crusade to go to the Holy Land, ostensibly under the cover of being the hospital uh, uh, knights who were to uh, care for and uh, help facilitate uh, travelers to the Holy Land that was newly opened from the Muslim world. Uh, but their true agenda was to find relics and artifacts underneath uh, King Solomon's temple that would verify that they, in fact, were uh, the progeny uh, that originated with Christ. And uh, that would give them the validity to come back and, and uh, uh, have leverage in a in a political sense in the in the medieval world. Okay, go on with your story. Okay, essentially, while they were there in uh, their their time period in, in in trying to find these relics, they interfaced with the Muslim community there, who had a very articulate development of a mathematical system, and uh, they picked this up from them and. Uh, they have employed that mathematics in their architecture and in other aspects of their activities across time. Uh, and the culmination of it in more recent centuries is that they have a, an itinerary essentially dictating how things are to transpire and a script to be played out according to this mathematical code. Their game plan. Their game plan. And uh, when you come up to the time period when uh, Isaac Newton and uh, uh, other people of his period, uh, which is very well uh, developed in a, a book by Robert Lomas, and essentially we think of, of Isaac Newton as the great scientist. Well, he was also uh, practiced the black arts at the same time. He retained his, his uh, interest in alchemy at the same time as being renowned as a mathematician and an astronomer. Uh, this was true of a number of the people of, of his colleagues who were Masons at the time. And this was uh, the founding of the Age of Reason. So there was a marriage between alchemy and science in a way that uh, they're employing alchemy and, what? and who and science. Sci science science and alchemy were merged together right. in their Masonic tradition and uh, this mathematical uh, development had two parallels one that pertains to physics and chemistry and things that we know to today is you know our technological society and the other was a covert code that was developed in terms of uh, the, the Masonic traditions of uh, interest in controlling political and social forces. A secret society? Yes. Within a secret society? Within a secret society, within a secret society. Right. Okay. They are very, very uh, 
hierarchical, and if you take a look at the Masonic uh, uh, structure, uh, the average Mason is, uh, elevates himself to about the third degree. Uh, and most of the Ma Masonic uh, work that is done are, are very honorable and, and worthwhile endeavors in the community. Uh, and most Masons have no idea what's going on at the top. And when you get through all the levels up to the 33rd degree level, uh, where you, the real power resides, uh, there is a, a retention of a ritual and tradition that dates all the way back to uh, the Sumerian period prior to the Egyptian civilization. And their um, acknowledgement of the gods and goddesses of that Sumerian period. And that is at the core of their uh, ritual and tradition and uh, it is directive of, of their uh, behavior and uh, where they're going today. So you read this book? This and uh, the other book that is helpful is understanding how the, the tradition of the Knights Templar had come over from Europe to the United States, or I should say to America. And uh, this book here uh, by William Mann is uh, very useful in understanding how that tradition had been transplanted from Europe uh, through uh, Nova Scotia and the movement of the Knights Templar and their treasure to Nova Scotia through Henry Sinclair in the 1440s. And um, that is a date that will have a number that is recurring in the code. But uh, the year 1440. Well, the number 1440 will okay, be not the year. Well, that is is the year that that uh, ostensibly there was a movement of the uh, Knights Templar treasure from Europe to Nova Scotia. Yes. Okay, and then what happened after that? Th these reading these books brought this to light and started making you put the pieces together. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And it, it, each, each book, uh, these and other books, each have clues spread among them. There is no one book that has it all put together in one place in terms of this itinerary code that they're, they're working from. But uh, picking up the uh, bits of evidence here and there, it, it, it patches together and you'll see how well it patches together. Go. Cool. Okay. Well, this itinerary that they have is essentially a script that they're following and their activities pertain to um, acting out uh, their accomplishments or their aims on at points in time that are regarded as permissible. And their future acts. And their future acts. So this is something that not only uh, gives you a, an understanding of the past, but it also gives you a handle on what's going to happen in the future. Okay. And this code is embedded in a marriage, uh, going back again to this idea that there was a marriage between alchemy and real science. They have taken that idea and had uh, addressed the earth and its movement and uh, the, the, the celestial sphere, the stars and, and such as a reflection of that mathematical code. Explain alchemy. Alchemy is essentially uh, different things to different people. The original uh, intent uh, prior to chemists working with materials in order to create new things, there was the belief that you could take one substance and turn it into gold and there was uh, interest in, you know, creating wealth through this, this process of transmuting other materials into gold. Uh, more recent uh, uh, definitions of alchemy are uh, presented in the, in the sense of transforming the inner person. And so, as I say, alchemy means different things to different people, but they are subjective endeavors. And for your purposes, they mean what? Uh, essentially, that is uh, uh, the platform by which their subjective spiritual, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, 
world comes together and married is married with the real objective world and the sciences and the sciences right so they their their use of mathematics and the sciences have been uh, following two parallel paths throughout time and uh, what do we have here let's uh, let's explain this okay there are certain things that that they have uh, observed in nature that that are beyond uh, expectation and an example of that would be in, in an analogy would be the diameter of the moon is just perfect so that when you have an eclipse it just exactly blocks out the sun now the moon could have been a variety of diameters it could have been a variety of distances from the earth it could be going at various angles relative to earth but it is in an orbit such that it is a perfect size at the right distance that it actually blocks out the sun. Now the odds of that are very, very small unless there's some helping hand from a supernatural being to accomplish that. They would look at something like that in a sense of instru being instructive and looking at that to see why should we pay attention to that? Why, is it, why are we drawing our attention to that? Physical things like that have led to the understanding that there are other kind of amazing uh, coincidences between mathematics and, and reality. For instance, <clears throat> the Earth has uh, uh, geophysical forces that cause it to wobble, and uh, they have a, a variety of, of uh, uh, periods of time that they act through. Uh, the shor shortest precession cycle or wobble is 432 days long, and that's the Chandler cycle. And I, have, okay, and that's. Well, let's, let's start in the center there. What does the center mean, mathematically and uh, ge that, geometric code? This is a a figurative center. Or it's core. right there. Yeah, this is a figurative core. This is the 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 code system itself. It's ma mathematical and geometric, and it's in its. Uh, nature and it would take a, a whole separate presentation to get into the depth of that but uh, is this the core of the earth no I, I mean it's just I'm just drawing it here as a as a figurative core of the itinerary code right, okay? okay and this is um, reflected throughout the shells and one of the amazing things with these uh, forces that cause the wobbles and the durations that they... You're saying that the Earth wobbles? In more than one way. You right. Have, you have three or four different wobbles going on simultaneously. It's sort of like one of those rides in Disneyland where you're going six different directions at the same time. Okay. But these, so, these uh, wobbles are, are very slow in their progression and some of them are extremely slow in their progression. So the shortest one being the Chandler cycle, and that's only 432 days long. And it what does that mean? 432 days long to make a, a full circuit of of one revolution of wobble. Okay, just like it, you would have one turn in one day, one duration of this cycle going 360 degrees throughout its wobble is 432 days period. Uh, the now, does that mean that it wobbles one direction and the others wobble it's, it's the a other circular, direction? It's a circular. Circular wobble. Wobble. Okay. Yeah. Each of these are, are like a circular or a tilt wobble. The, ch the Chandler wobble is just a very short uh, length being only about 300, I'm sorry, th about 30 feet long. But it's important in terms of uh, GPS technology because the Naval Observatory has to keep track of it to keep the satellites and the GPS ground system synchronized together. So this very minor uh, cycle uh, does have a, a real impact in, in terms of de today's technology. The nutation cycle is another uh, precession or, or wobble, and it lasts 18 years. Or, and I'm presenting these values here in, in a way that um, I'm trying to accentuate the fact that there is a mathematical relationship between these, not just um, that they 
happen to be these numbers, but these numbers relate to each other mathematically in very unique ways. The nutation cycle is induced by the moon going around the Earth, and that wobble being 18.6 uh, years is uh, a very amazingly, if you take 4.32 4 and square it, you get 18.6624. Likewise, if you take 432 and multiply it by 60, you get the zodiac precession cycle, which lasts 25,920 years. So, uh, when, you, when you say 25,920 years, you mean it starts over again mm -hmm. after that? Right. This keeps going on and on, and it takes 2,160 years to go through one phase of the zodiac. That's what this ecliptic or zodiac precession cycle is. We've just entered into the age of Aquarius and we'll be in that for another 2160 years. So um, each of these ages have certain reflective uh, meanings in, in terms of their ritual, uh, in, in their mysticism, in their mythology, and, uh, and it's also reflected in the, this mathematics. How about this ob obliquity, the tilt, that's the way it tilts? The earth tilts and it ranges in a, uh, between 22 degrees and, and 24 uh, degrees in, in its axis relative to the sun. And so it doesn't keep a constant tilt. It, it, it varies over this period of 40,000 years. Are you saying that these various, uh, the Chandler, the nutation and so forth, uh, are all uh, acting at the same time then? Yes, they're acting at the same time. Well, yes. now, how, how can that be? One is on, a, on, a, on, a, on an angle one way, and the other one is wiggling the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to understand or to believe. Well, it, it's, it's hard to probably conceive of, but uh, astronomers keep track of it. And uh, just as they keep track of the Chandler cycle for uh, keeping GPS systems on track, they keep track of these others and making adjustments for the others is not, they don't have to make the adjustments quite as frequently, but they do occur and uh, they're very well documented. So uh, uh, geophysical is has that this particular... The inner earth. So are you saying that the, the brown or the core on the in, inside the earth is one that, that wiggles and... Green is the outer surface. The green the, is the outer and surface. Then, and the brown is the, the core or the, or the inner earth. So are you saying that the, the brown or the core on the in, inside the earth is one that, that wiggles and vibrates? Yes, the, the, whole, the, the whole of the earth, right. But the whole earth does at the same right. time, yeah. Okay. Right. And then what about the earth's surface? Uh, now the earth's surface has uh, a transition from nature providing the mathematical code or, or uh, to follow where man takes over and starts to reflect that code. And this happens with the architecture that the Masons have employed in their construction of cathedrals and other monuments around the world. Uh, the pyramids are a, a, the most famous example of a reflection of, of the application of this, these code values into architecture and uh, cathedrals and everything that we see from the period of uh, medieval and uh, Renaissance Europe when they were, uh, uh, Freemasons were uh, responsible for that building period up to and including today uh, with mu mu much of the monuments that they have constructed as well. In recent years... Yeah, you're going you're to show some examples of oh this yes. well, at each, each, as we go on. As we go on. And then in recent years, in the last 50 or 60 years, they have taken this application of, of architecture and employing this mathematical system to the aeronautical level. They being? The Skull and Bones uh, organization and the 33rd degree Masons. Uh, Knights Templar? I imagine that there are, are various uh, divisions within that, the organization. There are many divisions within the 33rd degree masonry uh, umbrella that, that are involved in this, yes. Do you think what you're telling me now and what you're going to tell me is in the next hour or so, hour and a half, two hours, is a part of their secret uh, uh, information that they give to their members? Only at the very top. 
you don't pass this on to a third degree master mason. That's my point. Yeah, they have no clue so about what this. you're saying is you've you think that you've come up with the secrets of the 33rd degree masons information about their activities and some of the uh, secrets that they hold within their own organization. Is that, that what you're saying now? Yes, they and the school. That's what you're going to uh, deal with in the next hour, two hours. Yes. Very interesting. Okay, keep going. Like I well, say, let's talk about this uh, aeronautical then. Like, like, how does that apply to this situation? Well, uh, our aviation system is is very young and relative to history, but they've been in control of it from the very inception up until this very day, and there are aspects of the federal aviation airway system that is a reflection of the code. And I'll give examples of that. What code now? This would be a reflection of the code that we, we see on these other levels at the, at, at the earth core and at the surface. The same okay. code. The same code. Now, how far does that extend from the earth's surface, the, the aeronautical, uh, the, as, the light blue? As, as, as high as airplanes fly. And then we transition into the celestial level where planets and stars become involved with this as well. And that's the uh, top celestial is the dark blue. Right. Okay, very interesting. And I guess uh, one quick example of the celestial that is probably of interest is that when the Illuminati were formed and the formation of our United States government in 1776, or the onset of it, I should say, um, there was a particular meteor that was in orbit in a certain place in the sky, and that was the comet Temple. Okay, That is the very same comet that they crashed a NASA probe into on July 4th of last year. So from July 4th of 1776 to July 4th, 2005, that meteor was in the same position, and they chose that date of July 4th to crash a probe into it. Why do you why do you think they did that? Well, I, of course there is the scientific value in doing that, but parallel with it, I'm sure that there is a mystical meaning uh, corresponding to it, and uh, that I would have to uh, leave to other experts to speculate on. That's uh, research in the future. Yes, that's future research. We need to get uh, into uh, actual conversation with people who are responsible for this. Okay, what's next? What do we have next? Have you well, covered this topic? I think that what we can go into is start looking at uh, things that happen on the surface that people can see as a reflection of this code and uh, realize how it is being employed and uh, then we'll go on to the aeronautical level and see how that ties in as well. Okay. Okay. If we uh, move along here. I'm going to start off with a chapter that we'll call the Seal of Astroth. Astroth is a uh, Sumerian god, uh, as I say, dating prior to uh, the Egyptian period, in which uh, the much of the black arts of uh, the satanic uh, movement uh, that we see in practice today uh, was born out of that period. And each of these gods during that period had a particular seal or emblem that uh, signified th th that particular <coughs> god. And I'm going to uh, uh, address the application of the seal to the architecture that they have employed on uh, a grand scale. Go. Cool. Okay. All right, I'm going to pass by here and bring you to a satellite view of Washington, D.C. You're about 68,000 feet above the, the Capitol, and I've outlined in this rectangular area where the, the mall and the Capitol and those buildings are. If we take a look at that same area, there was a, a mason of great significance by the name of Len Font who designed the city plan for Washington, D.C. Uh, he had such a significance 
in terms of the honor <coughs> bestowed on him on his death. He was the only civilian who was not military or political figure that was laid in state in the rotunda up until Rosa Parks this last year. Those are the only two people ever to lie in state in the rotunda who are not military or official. Okay, so his grand plan for the city plan included the famous driving circles. If you've ever driven through uh, Washington, D.C., you know that it is a great challenge. And one of the challenges is getting around these various driving circles, the DuPont Circle, Scott Circle, Logan Circle, Washington Circle, and Mount Vernon. And I just depicting where those circles are relative to the White House right there. Okay. If we bring those points together, we have a pentagram. And as you'll see as we move along here, we have much more than just a pentagram. You want to explain a pentagram? A pentagram is a uh, symbol of uh, one of the uh, primary symbols that are used in uh, the, the black arts of, of witchcraft. But also it is uh, part of the ma mathematical tradition as well uh, in that Pythagoras uh, was the first person to uh, realize that if you have a certain kind of triangle and if you overlap three of them together you get a pentagram. Uh, he was uh, very much interested in the, the interface of mathematics and, and life and uh, trying to reflect a, a living pattern based on mathematics and had a whole school of, of uh, followers. So it has a mathematical tradition as well as a, a tradition in, in witchcraft. And by the way, in the human sacrifices and the satanic culture noted for that, uh, it, that's used in the ceremony itself. Uh, this and other, uh, other symbols as well. Right. More articulate s symbols. Um, if you consider the, that, the layout of that pentagram and then consider uh, three other uh, landmarks on uh, in the uh, Washington area. One being the Masonic Temple of the 33rd Degree Supreme Council, and that is considered to be the uh, overall leadership of the Masonic uh, uh, organization throughout the world. And another uh, major landmark is over in Alexandria, Virginia, which is the Masons Washington Memorial. And a third landmark, uh, ironically, is the Vice Presidential Mansion. If we take a look at 16th Street, straight north of the White House, we have the 33rd Degree Temple. Now, this headquarters of the, of the masonry had uh, essentially been uh, a out uh, uh, shoot of the, the history that uh, was involved with the, the uh, revolutionary period where the British masonry influence in the United States became secondary because of the political conflict and the French tradition was much more in favor and, and was much more employed in the, the masonry here in the United States after the, the Revolutionary War. In the French tradition, um, the uh, accent or influence of these, these uh, Sumerian gods and goddesses is much more at the core of their ritual. And that's uh, whenever you see a sign outside of a little town that says AF and AM, it means ancient, free, and, and accepted masonry, uh, where you see the little mason sign at the edge of town. And the and where would that be? In what countries? Yeah, I mean, every little town in the United States. I mean, outside of every little town, you'll have a little mason sign saying, you know, we meet here on such and such day and time. And in, as part of that sign, it will say AF and AM. And that means ancient, free, and accepted masonry. 
And the important part of that is the ancient part, which is the ancient, tr ancient tr tr tradition that came out of that French influence, okay? And that uh, in involvement of these uh, very early gods and goddesses in their ritual, okay? That 33rd degree temple is straight north of the White House, okay? And if you take a look at the vertices it's of right these, there. right? And if you take a look at the vertices of uh, these pentagram pattern, uh, it's bisects uh, this vertice here, and of course is directly in line with the White House itself. Now, during this time period when Washington D.C. was being constructed. There was competition between the French and the English and America for having the prime meridian right in their backyards. And the English, for whatever reason, uh, have one out, and Greenwich is the pr where the prime re meridian resides. But in our attempt to be the founders of the prime meridian, or the, the holders or the host of the prime meridian, there is a marker just outside on the lawn of the White House indicating this is what they hope to be the zero meridian marker. Okay, and in fact, the hill up here is Meridian Hill. Okay. So there, there again, the interface between the subjective and the real is being played out. Another in interesting point is that St. John's Church is adjacent to this line just north of the White House. St. John is, is very important in the Knights Templar and the Masons tradition. Okay. So that's no accident that St. John's Church happens to show up where it does. If we go down to Alexandria, Virginia, we see an aerial view here of the Masonic Washington Memorial. And you can see how the architecture, again, is very ornate and has specific significance uh, mathematically and geometrically. It's no accident that they laid it out this way. It's not just that it's a pretty pattern. The relative position of that monument, uh, the uh, Masonic Washington Memorial in Alexandria, relative to the 33rd degree temple is, is illustrated here. These are all uh, satellite shots? Yes, these are aerial. And you put these together yourself? Yes, I did, yes. If you look at that same line, that orange line that runs down through uh, uh, to the uh, George Washington Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, it provides some additional guiding lines for additional uh, points of interest. This point right here is where the signers of the De Declaration of Independence Memorial is. Uh, if you take a look at this particular arrow here and points off to the Naval Observatory and the, uh, the, and the Vice Presidential Mansion. Looking at the the line through here up to here intersects the 33rd degree temple, okay? Each of these construction lines gives you guidance in laying out this pattern. This pattern happens to be the seal of Astaroth. So they have trademarked our capital with the seal of a god. This is a god who uh, allegedly uh, cannot tell a lie when asked about the future. So their interest in Astaroth has to do with uh, having a knowledge of and controlling the future. So a central role of the, this uh, 33rd degree masonry uh, uh, institution is about controlling future events. Okay. All right, so at this point, I would like to transition to the second portion of this, 
These secret societies within the domain of the Masonry organization and, and others essentially are not only uh, formulating the new government in the United States and at its inception, but they're, they're expressing their dominant control across time ever since. And they do this architecturally. Jump to, once again, here's the location of the uh, mall area in Washington, D.C. And uh, once again, this is the overlay of the seal of Astaroth on the street pattern and uh, the layout in Washington, D.C. And just to review where the 33rd degree temple is. Now, if we take a look at lines of, of dominance, I would call them, because they essentially assert that the 33rd degree temple, which is located right here, is in direct line with the intersection of these points of the pentagram to the Department of Defense from the temple across this point to the Capitol and of course straight down through this vertice to this point to the White House. And it's evident by having these projections going across from the 30, 30, 33rd degree temple to a point on the star that these are dominant of levels of the government. Secondarily, if we follow projections from the 33rd degree uh, temple across vertices like here, 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 and here, we come up with essentially going uh, clockwise around it, the Department of Justice right here, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Interior, and the Department of State. And it's no accident that the choice of location for these institutions coincide with alignments between the 33rd degree temple and vertices on the pentagram. Pennsylvania Avenue has a, a unique uh, aberration in that at the White House it goes to uh, a kind of a kilter if you were to follow from the Capitol down Pennsylvania Avenue. If you went on, on straight line it, you would hit run into buildings. They have offset the western portion of Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House at, a, at an angle that intercepts this corner of the pentagram. And there's a, a reason why they do that. That allows them to acknowledge that from this point to this point points to the Treasury, they, another very important portion of the government's activity. Going from point to point, from across from here to here, brings you to the Department of Labor. So, monetary control and control of production is a central core of what they regard as a government's responsibility and their responsibility uh, to control. As afterthoughts, we have lines that go through a vertice here and here to the Supreme Court, okay? From this vertice here to this one here, we're in line with the Federal Reserve. And it's evident that these institutions are tertiary in their concern in terms of control of society. Okay. Connecting the dots, all right? Between the 33rd degree uh, Mason organization, there are other organizations that have allied themselves with it. And uh, one of the organizations of most prominence and of most significance relative to recent events is the Skull and Bones organization. Skull and Bones is a Masonic-like organization that is based at Yale University and seniors at Yale are invited in based on characteristics that they deem to be significant to be members of the club. There are only 15 each year 
and uh, a good accounting of the Skull and Bones organization, if you don't mind handing me that book, not that one, the other one there, is, is given in an account by Anthony Sutton. Uh, this is not a recent, uh, uh, he had, I forget, I think it was in the 1970s that he had written this particular, and it is as important today to understand how across time the Skull and Bones organization has controlled history since the 1880s up until the present time. And it's important to realize who are members of the Skull and Bones organization. Go ahead, name them. <laughs> I'll give you three biggies. The three biggies are Dick Cheney, George Bush uh, Sr., George uh, Herbert Walker Bush, as well as George W. Bush. And another uh, interesting side light is um, Kerry, our other presidential nominee this previous election cycle, was also a member of Skull and Bones. So Skull and Bones would have been in control no matter who won. And in fact, that is how they strategize. They are in control of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. There is a level of control that exists above those two parties and the Democratic Party and the Republican parties are secondary players in a bigger picture. Absolutely. Okay. So, so if they have demonstrated this kind of architectural and mathematical relationship to uh, institutions of, as we've demonstrated, what about this possible connection with Yale, between Yale University and the Skull and Bones organization, which on their campus is located right here. You may notice that, like in Washington, D.C., the campus is laid out with pentagram patterns and their walkways and their, and their uh, quadrangle areas. So it's no accident that there's a reflection of the same kind of, of pentagram uh, detail on their campus uh, as well as in Washington, D.C. And this precedes the construction of this campus precedes Washington, D.C. Okay, and this is where the Skull and Bones building is located. It's also known as the tomb. That's how they regard that refer to their building. Another secret society. Yes, I mean, the, the probably the most powerful secret society. The alums being? Members of the Illuminati. This is the American faction of the Illuminati. Okay. The Illuminati haven't been formed uh, in, early, in 1776, May the 1st, was when the 25 goals of the Illuminati were announced. Uh, the last of those 25 goals was to take over the world. And uh, they're on their way. And they're well on their way. And it's, as it's coming up fast. Uh, we were, we're marching towards that very quickly. If you take a look at back in Washington, D.C., the 33rd degree of temple and this point on the pentagram pattern, and if you draw a line from here in both directions, you can create a circle that goes all the way around the Earth. Navigators regard this as, as what they call great circles, uh, both uh, aeronautical and, and maritime navigators use great circle navigation to get to the shortest distance between two points on a, a spherical surface. So if you take a look at a line that, that goes along that uh, construction of, I'm trying to find my, there it is, from this point here to the 33rd degree temple and if follow it along, it marches up along the east coast, goes through New York City, right over the head of the Statue of Liberty. Now this is a culmination of the French Masonic influence and in placing the Statue of Liberty squarely under the Skull and Bones, what I will refer to as the Skull and Bones Great Circle. Because if you follow along here, uh, it goes all the way around the, the world, uh, but it also, I'm sorry, I need to back up. I, I missed my, I should have backed up when I went forward. I'm sorry. Essentially, 
it goes through some very interesting areas like the Mideast and uh, Nazareth and, and uh, Israel. It goes through, uh, look at these, these locations. It, it goes through England, France, Switzerland, Italy, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, I can't pronounce it, Bosnia, where we've had uh, recent and recent years had uh, activity. Um, it goes straight through the Israeli-Palestine area, Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Herzegovina. Yes, thank you for pronouncing that. Herzegovina. Yes, where we had uh, the conflict in the 1990s. So it's no uh, accident that we have these conflicts right on the Skull and Bones line because it's part of the agenda. That line goes straight to, straight across the Yale campus right here, okay? So that's where that line emanating from one point on the star and the 33rd degree temple in uh, Washington, D.C. ends up crossing this pattern here at Yale campus relative to the skull and bones. Okay. All right, so this brings two organizations together in a very expressive, demonstrative way. It's no accident that Washington, D.C. and Yale campus have this geometry together and that they are aligned along the skull and bones great circle joining them together they are married together in their activities okay and that that has been the case since its inception uh, at the beginning of, of um, the founding of this nation okay let me go on to our next one they declare authorship of their actions and they assign lines of responsibility both within organizations and on the surface of the earth. And I'll demonstrate that in a number of ways. Once again, just to get review, this is where the layout of the 33rd degree temple relative to the White House is and those relationships to those branches of government. Let's go back to the President Lincoln's assassination. I indicated that there are lines of responsibility that we think of and within the hierarchy of organizations is most commonly when we think of that. But they also lay out these lines of responsibility on the ground. If you take a look at the 33rd degree temple following through this vertice right here on down to here, also from this point across this vertice to the same location to that little red circle right there, that is Ford's Theater. That is where President Lincoln was assassinated. After providing two lines of attack on the President, they give you an honor line. This goes through the 33rd degree temple to on through this vertice, vertice on down to the Lincoln Memorial. Now if you see this just as in terms of one event then you would think well maybe it's a fluke. Well let's look on farther. Let's go on to McKinley. McKinley was shot at the train station. Here again we get two lines of responsibility from the 33rd degree temple across this point of the star to the train station here across these two um, points of the star to the train station. Okay, then they give a line of recognition or honor between this star point, this vertice down to the McKinley Memorial, which is, sits just outside of the, of the National Nation's Capitol building right here. If you go along the mall in either directions, right along that line from emanating from the Capitol is the McKinley Memorial right there. So here in a second 
case we have the very same configuration or utilization of, of lines of responsibility. Okay. Let's consider President Kennedy. When we take a look at the one line of attack from point across point to point, that goes straight on to where his grave is. Okay. There's an honor line of, of for President Kennedy in the sense of the Kennedy Center being across from the third, 33rd degree temple and this point to the Kennedy Center. So if there's only one line of responsibility, why is that, of attack I should say, why is that relative to the other two? Well, one reason is because it was not done in town. And if you have the occasion of trying to get something done outside of town, it's always good to enlist a friend. If you take a look at where the skull and bones line goes around the earth, as it goes through Yale campus here, its heading is at a 54 degree heading when you go north away from the Yale campus. If you follow this longitude of, of uh, or latitude of 41 degrees north where Yale resides and transmute that 54 degree heading value along this line to a 54 degree longitude value right here. That puts a, a point right out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But if you take and that point right there, connect it to the 33rd degree temple and follow it along you come to Dealey Plaza in Texas. Not only do you come to Dealey Plaza in Texas, you come to Dealey Plaza at the point where Kennedy was shot. This is the, the line of attack coming from that point out in the Atlantic Ocean through the 33rd degree temple in Washington, D.C. to the very place where Kennedy was shot, down to the foot. Now that kind of math mathematical precision is a signature. It is a modus operandi. A little more than a coincidence. Beyond any imaginable coincidence. It's not even possible to be a coincidence. Okay, <clears throat> another interesting aspect about this, if you take a look at the skull and bones line as it, as, uh, or not the skull and bones line, but that line of attack to uh, Dallas, and take a 90 degree angle turn from that, that attack line at the, the 33rd degree temple. It goes through this vertice here. It goes through Ford's Theater and it comes to the FBI building. Amazing. Could this be a line of responsibility? I think so. All right. Maybe you can comment about the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say uh, there's a different FBI today than uh, when I was in the FBI. I retired in, in March 1979, mm -hmm. 21 years under J. Edgar Hoover. I don't care what you say about J. Edgar Hoover. He ran a very great, he ran a great organization. We were known as the elite of all investigative agencies uh, and all law enforcement agencies in the world thanks to J. Edgar Hoover. And um, it's it, right after he died, it started, very frankly, it started uh, declining. And when was the, his death? Well, uh, there were some good directors along the way. Uh, of course, we had uh, L. Patrick Gray, Rum, 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 um, uh, Rums, uh, not Rumsfeld, but Rucklesaus. Rucklesaus, yes. Was temporary. Yes. And then L. Patrick Gray, and then we had Clarence Kelly, Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had uh, Louis, uh, not Louis Free, but uh, Bill Webb. No, we had uh, Bill Webster. And then we had uh, Session, and then we had Free. And, uh, and uh, who do we have today? <laughs> okay, we've gone on to uh, Webster? No, no, Webster's. I'm, uh, the, I'm sorry. The last one was, uh, who replaced Free? 
I'm Ash sorry. Ashcroft. Ashcroft no, was he attorney was general. Attorney general. And um, William Mueller. 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 That's Mueller. Right, Mueller. Mueller's right. our director today. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're both. Well, uh, yeah. Well, late at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I've been out 26, 27 years. So yes, right. We had quite a transition into the modern day era, and uh, the FBI has changed considerably from the time that I retired. Not because of me, but. Well. It's uh, been because those were different and times, and, right. and, and, and uh, very frankly, it's not the organization it used to be. Um, I, have, uh, I have case after case that I presented to the FBI. I have an international child kidnapping case uh, out of Washington, D.C., known as the Finders, mm -hmm. which is a CIA covert operation. Uh, ties into satanic cults, no question about it. It's been operating since the early 1960s, and uh, I've formally filed complaints at least half a dozen times with the FBI and demanded an investigation. I've given that report to other uh, very res so-called responsible uh, 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 authorities in Washington, D.C., demanded an investigation. I've been ignored. I had advanced information about uh, 911. Uh, actually, I didn't have it. One of my sources did. Gave it to the FBI um, on March the 20th, 2001. Ignored. Uh, the FBI was involved in um, uh, the uh, car bombing on uh, February 26, uh, 1993, of the World Trade Center. According to the New York Times article, uh, October 28, 1993, uh, the FBI had an informant in among the terrorists. Uh, he was ordered by the terrorists to put the bomb together. Uh, he went to his superiors and the FBI, his handlers. Uh, we're going to use a dummy bomb. No, the FBI superior said, supervisor said, no, we're going to use a real bomb. So the FBI not only knew in advance, they furnished ingredients for the bomb. And we, the direction. And the direction, that's right. So uh, we, the FBI has been corrupted. Yes. And because of my outspoken position uh, with the FBI, I have been kicked out of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. I've been expelled. And I'm not, uh, I'm not concerned about that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it kind of has a little joke I recently called and told him I wanted to be reinstated and never received a response back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's going to have to go through a transition before I, I we, think we expect we're a response. We'll have to bring Jack <laughs> Hoover back, I think. Would you expect that there may be a, a small circle of covert uh, FBI agents who may have been involved with uh, these kinds of operations? Uh, uh, there's absolutely back, no question about it. Back at the Kennedy period. Uh, I have uh, knowledge uh, of... Uh, covert operation by the FBI involving five different agents from different FBI field divisions who were called in. They, they're not involved on their day-to-day -day work with uh, each other. They're called in for assignments and uh, off they go. Uh, and uh, I don't know the details of their assignments, but I know one of them uh, was involved in drugs. Uh, this particular FBI agent was assigned to Omaha and he operated out of Offutt Air Force Base the SAC base, as you know, uh, right outside Omaha, and which uh, is known as a CIA operation. Uh, there's a lot of CIA activity within off at Air Force Base. Um, so I have this knowledge. I know that uh, within our government, there are two elements. There's the covert and the overt. Uh, the overt operation are the fellows in the suits and the ties that show up at the bank robbery. And what did he look like and how tall and what did he weigh? The covert operation uh, involves uh, assassinations, uh, burglary, <laughs> murder, kidnappings, uh, and they're regular criminals. And they're recruited out of special forces, including McVeigh, who was recruited out of special forces, by the way, on Oklahoma City. And uh, these people answer to no one. There's no paper trail. And uh, they're used, they use these men and women for uh, covert surveillances, illegal activity, criminal activity, and you're looking at one of the victims, by the way, I might mention. I have absolute documentation that I have in my system as we sit here and look at the camera, and I'm looking at you and the camera. I have absolute documentation from a laboratory that I have three times uh, the uh, safe level of arsenic in my system. and. It is, uh, has been administered to me through aerosol. Uh, I have needle marks in my car between the door and the door jam, where they put poison into my car uh, when it's locked and the windows are all up. And uh, I breathe this and it goes into my system. I have this 
it's well documented. So uh, this is a covert operation of the government. I think that uh, in particular, this is uh, probably uh, NSA, uh, military intelligence, uh, working together. Uh, one, one of the interesting things that you made an observation of no paper trail. Uh, the masonry organization is so secretive about even their rituals that they leave no paper trail about their internal operations or their rituals. Everything is word of mouth, so it is a very few trusted individuals that actually get into the very inner circle and retain this oral communication. Uh, Bob, I interviewed Jip Tatum, 25-year black ops operator with the CIA. And he told me that he could go into a bank in, uh, I think it was Rochester, New York, and on his signature obtain $250,000 cash for some of his covert operations, and he'd use that to pay off his buddies with no paper trail. So uh, we have this. Now we have, most recently, President Bush has announced that we have secret wiretaps, right, without going through the courts. Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Act of 1978 uh, which was signed by Jimmy Carter, as I recall, mm -hmm. uh, allowed for us to uh, wiretap secretly uh, through the courts certain individuals who were suspected of being involved in terrorist activities. Right. This latest move uh, does not go through the courts whatsoever, and the president and Gonzalez, our attorney general today, are standing up and defending it, saying it's all right uh, because we're just doing it against the bad terrorists, who are in communication overseas only. Do you believe that? You believe that? And I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, and I'll tell you right now, I'll, I'm, a, I'm a New York City garbage man if you believe that. That is absolute unbelievable that the President of the United States would be involved in a criminal act like this. You and I do some illegal wiretapping without going through anybody. What do you think is going to happen to us? We go to jail for 20, 30, 40 years. So this whole thing, this whole, it's a scam. And it's a sham. And it's a, a march forward rapidly by the New World Order, the globalists, whatever you want to call them, toward taking over the world. And that's what we're talking about here. That's right. And one of the, the biggest uh, uh, absence of a paper trail is on uh, September 10th when Donald Rumsfeld announced that they, they lost track of uh, over uh, a trillion dollars. <laughs> that was September 10th of uh, 2001. 2001. Right, the day before the 9 The day before 9 and then because of 2 because of 911, of course, everybody forgot about that one. That's right. So the paper trail that got lost then it has remained lost today. Well, I wonder where that went. Mm -hmm. Do you think it might have gone to Switzerland? Oh, man, a number of interesting places like that. Right. Yes. I, I think that one of these uh, this, this line goes through Switzerland that we're talking about, doesn't it? We're uh, going to discuss that tomorrow? We can discuss that later, but it does go straight through Zurich. Yes, it's right at the, the core of it. And of course, the Knights Templar are the founders of our uh, banking system that we know today, and that was uh, developed uh, in the medieval and uh, period and during their uh, tenure of control over the European uh, political scene. So uh, this is uh, something that hasn't changed okay, in all this time. So, Well, well I, uh, we have some more here, I believe, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes, okay, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> we, we're only started. This is only we're the just, We're just getting warmed up. We're just getting warmed up. Okay. All right, so if we want to take a look at Martin, Martin Luther King's assassination, we don't have to go very far because they used the same line. <laughs> They didn't have to draw a new line for uh, as after the Kennedy assassination because the line that they had created for the ass assassination of President Kennedy goes through Memphis. <laughs> they didn't have to do any work. You know, it's just, just, just repeat the same page. They had to wait till he went to Memphis to do it, though. They got him there, and they did. Yeah, they waited till he went there to do it, though. Just like they got Kennedy to Dallas to do it. That's right. Okay, I think that Johnson probably had a hand in that. Um, in any case, I know that Johnson had a hand in that. Yeah. In any case, if you uh, take a look at uh, the fact that uh, that attack line goes straight through uh, Memphis where he was, Martin Luther King was uh, assassinated, once again, we have to have an honor line. And we create that honor line for Martin Luther King by going for, 
at Washington, D.C. We go from this vertice through this vertice to the Martin Luther King Library, right along that line, along the same line that goes to the Supreme Court. So there may be some figurative relationship there. It's hard to actually understand, but it's the same line. Let's come to September 11th, 2001. What happened on the surface of the Earth that was a reflection of their plan? Well, that plan or that geometry had been sitting there all along, all throughout time. Again, if you take a look at where the Skull and Bones Great Circle Line goes through this vertice and the 33rd degree temple on to uh, Skull and Bones in, in Yale, and you draw a 90 degree angle from the Skull and Bones Line through this vertice, you come to the FBI building. From uh, a 90 degree departure from the Skull and Bones Line through this vertice, brings you to the Department of Justice. The most interesting line of responsibility of all is a line, it's uh, maybe hard to see, but it's a green line that starts at this vertice, goes through this vertice, and ends up at this point right here, which is the FAA. So the FAA had a significant hand in the development of events on 9-11. So when they planned to put the FAA building in this place, I believe in the 1960s probably is when they constructed it, uh, there was no accident that they put it along this line. They had intentions of using that line of re responsibility uh, decades ago. Let's take a look at the Pentagon. An aerial view again, and down here I've outlined in black the Pentagon building because it's a little bit faint against the background. If you take a look at a line running through these two vertices on down, as well as from the 33rd degree temple, um, I'm sorry, not th along this vertice, and that's not 33rd degree temple, that's just a, a vertice uh, of, of the pentagram through this vertice uh, point of the pentagram. It also passes by the pe Pentagon. Now, on closer inspection, one of those lines misses the building by several feet right here. But the other line, interestingly, goes through this north wall and this wall adjacent to it in a straight line. And the trajectory through which the allegedly Flight 77 attack came along this line is exactly at the outer wall intersection of this particular directory from the pentagram. And I think it's interesting to note that the opening was 16 feet across. It's a little bit small. A little bit small for uh, an airplane of that size, I uh, believe. For a 757, yes. 757. So. Yes. And in any case, um, but uh, the um, precision to come across um, from a line of, of uh, direction from the pentagram and have it intercept the very location on the wall that in, where the impact occurred and indicates a degree of precision that no human pilot could possibly have accomplished, number one, and to, of all sides of the building to hit, to exactly hit the intercept of that, that, that line at the wall is no accident. That was a plan, and it was not the pilot on board who accomplished that. I believe the, all the generals and the higher ups were on the other side of the building that day. They were they? very safe that day. Yes. Right. And we, we didn't lose anybody of, above the rank of probably the captain, clerks. clerk or captain, right. Mostly that side was vacated, and the planning for the construction uh, to vacate that part of the building was planned as part of the whole overall operation. Just as there was uh, a relative few uh, people on board those flights compared to all other flights who were transatlantic flights that day, or transcontinental flights that day. 
just to give you um, an indication of where the skull and bones line relative to the World Trade Center. This is the footprint of where it once was right here. And the, you see here how closely the skull and bones line comes past there. We'll have a little more detail about that later. Now you see here is again the employment of the Pythagorean pentagram geometry. If you have a, a triangle that has a 36 degree angle on two sides um, and 108 and then take three of those and overlap them you have a pentagram. If you take that triangle and lay it along the long side along the skull and bones line you have the flight path of flight Once again, just to, as a preface, this is that, that coating shell. And this is the application of the skull and bones itinerary to the aeronautical shell. And we'll go into a little bit of a preface and then how, when, who, and where. In this preface, we have uh, the Federal Aviation Administration offices that are responsible uh, for uh, the Federal, federal Aviation Airway System. In particular, there is an Office of Aviation System Standards and the National Aeronautical Charting Office. Together with the National Geogra Geospatial Intelligence Agency, these are the two primary uh, parties responsible for the development of all aeronautical charts uh, that are employed by pilots and, and also the placement and the operation of the navigational aids that are along um, the various airways. Okay. Um, I'm trying to recall where that, can you hand me that map there? That, it's sitting underneath there, right there. Thank you. Every FAA chart has a uh, declaration and right here it's in fine print and you can't you can't possibly see it on camera but I've got it right here and it says it's pu published in accordance with interagency air car cartographic committee specifications and agreements approved by the DOD and the FAA which means nothing gets on an FAA map used by a pilot that isn't approved of by the Department of Defense. These two are married together uh, at the hip and have always been the case. Now they had a, uh, in its prior iteration, the um, charting responsibilities were part of the uh, Air Force's Office of Aeronautical Charting and Information Center, which was in St. Louis, uh, incidentally. and. Uh, that became taken over in recent times by this uh, geospatial uh, organization, which is much more tied to DOD operations and intelligence operations. So now there's an intimate link between the uh, intelligence agencies and the uh, civil aviation activities. This here is what's called an IFR in route high altitude chart. And this is a uh, depiction of, of where that chart uh, covers in the United States. It's essentially the eastern United States. And this, this uh, chart is used strictly for operations that are above 18,000 feet. So primarily this is your jet and uh, commercial airway operations. Okay. All right. And these charts are offered in um, a very interesting listing. If you go to the FAA's website, you will see offerings for all these technical charts for all around the world 
in various manners and forms. And every one of these are strictly aviation technical charts, okay? Let's get to page two. We go down to, through the list, again, everything on this list is technical until you get to the end and it says historical maps. And under historical maps, they also have a little section that says posters, aeronautical posters, $4. But they don't list anything about what aeronautical posters they offer. They just make the declaration, if you send it $4, you'll get some sort of grab bag, I guess, of, of a poster. But it's very incidental to the fact that what they do very prominently offer is a map to Washington, D.C., which is the Enfant plan of the Washington, D.C., which we covered in the first sections, which was the seal of Astaroth. Okay? Now... This says uh, 1792. Yes. So, why... I'm sorry. Why would the Federal Aviation Administration make an offering for the city plan of Washington, D.C. from 1792 as part of its technical offering. Why? Because you're hanging out a shingle. It says, if you're one of us, you'll recognize why we list this here, so drop by and say hi, okay? This is analogous to the placards that are Mason's Post at the edge of small towns. If you remember, come on by, we're open for business. So, there is a a core of operation with the FAA that is controlled by the Skull and Bones Organization and the 33rd degree masonry, and this is their declaration of it. That may say, seem very incidental, but as we go on, you'll find that that is very compelling. Here's another con compelling thing. Up until November 18th in 2004, uh, there's no concern about offering aeronautical charts to the public. Anyone could purchase uh, a chart like this and other similar charts that pertain to various uh, aviation operations. But then they made the announcement effective October 2005, we are no longer offering these uh, what they call flip charts or uh, flight information publications to the public. After this date, they're proposing that we have to go through an authorized dealer who will check you out and only make the sale of these charts to appointed people. Like pilots? Pilots, uh, but uh, that had been not a concern or, uh, for 50 years. They have charts out there that they've been putting out all this time. Why all of a sudden? In recent months, are they shutting down the app availabilities to the general public? You have an answer for that? Yes. I thought you did. And you'll see it in just a moment. First off, I wanted to give you a little bit of a, an overview of how the National Aviation Airway System is organized. They use a station called a VOR, a very high frequency omnidirectional range station. I've got a depiction of, of one here sitting on a hill. And they have different flavors depending on whether it's tr strictly civil or this is the military version, the tactical aeronautical navigation station, or a merging, uh, of, merging of the two operations of, in a VORTAC, or a VOR that has additional distance measuring and equipment attached to it. Each of these are depicted on uh, aviation charts in such a way that they become waypoints along the way to what is essentially highways in the sky. And if you can just get an idea here, looking here, you can see these rows, um, compass rows here at the center, these are VOR stations and the lines between them are jet routes, which are essentially highways in the sky, all right? And because of the uh, camera not being able to pick up detail on there, I will transpose some of the information off of this chart onto the screen. 
Okay. All right. How does a VOR work? A, a, a pilot will will have an indicator on his dash that he'll dial in a particular line that he wants to fly. If he wants to fly 270 degree uh, direction away from the station, then if he if he does that. Uh, and he's on this side of the station, on the eastern side of the station, before he gets to the station. On this side, it'll indicate to the station. As he tr passes by the, the, the station, it'll indicate from the station and vice versa. So these stations provide directional information, not just telling which direction to the station, but it tells the pilot where they are relative on a compass direction from the station. And it does, doesn't have anything to do with the direction their nose is pointed. It only has an uh, indication of where their position is in the sky. Okay, how do we employ the skull and bones itinerary within the uh, aeronautical shell? Well, we take and we connect specific means of performing the attack with navigational aids that are adjacent to the attack sites. All right, how? Matching the attacking aircraft to navigational radio stations adjacent to the respective targets. Okay, I have a listing here of the four flights involved uh, in 9-11 that we're aware of. If we take a look at American Airlines Flight 11, there are three kinds of uh, identification you can find for an aircraft, one being the number that you would find on, on the tail of the aircraft indicating its FAA registration. It's just like a license plate. Of course, there's the aircraft model of American Airlines 11. Flight 11 was a 767-223. And then the serial number of production number that Boeing assigned to that aircraft. Flight American Airlines 11 was serial number 22332, and this prefix of 223 has nothing to do with, it is not a, a compulsory thing that you begin a series 223 aircraft with a serial number 223. For instance, uh, 757-223, the American Airlines uh, Flight 77, begins its digital uh, serial number with 246. Uh, this one has nothing to do with this serial sequen uh, number sequence or this with that, okay? But it is interesting that this number and the th first three digits here are the same digital sequence. Now, if we take a look at this map here in detail, what we would find is one of the jet routes that is emanates from, find my pointer here, from the LaGuardia VOR on, on the map, projects away from the station at a 322 degree direction, which incidentally is the code value for skull and bones. If you take a look at, find it here quickly here. Well, this is not a very good depiction of it, but I'll show it to you quickly. It has the skull and bones, and 322 is their um, organizational designation. Okay. What has happened throughout time is that they have used 322 as an indication of a heading, okay, as they have here. Notice that along jet route number 223, this one here, that's Jet Route 223, coming from LaGuardia VOR, is the is where we find American Airlines serial number 223 on Jet Route 223, emanating from a radial direction of 322 degrees, which is the Skull and Bones designation. This is the distance to a a uh, particular reporting, port, uh, reporting point that um, pilots use, or they call it a, a, a fix. 
Uh, in this case, it's a DMA fix. It's a distance from the station where when a pilot gets to that point, he would report to an air traffic controller his position and intentions to either turn or proceed or follow the flight plan. This little uh, label here indicates the number of nautical miles from that VOR station to that reporting po point called course. Each of these reporting, reporting points have, have a name. So when a pilot flies over, he, he indicates to the, to the uh, air traffic controller that he has passed cords. 74 happens to be the exact longitude of the World Trade Center. Okay. LaGuardia VOR is the VOR station closest to the World Trade Center. Okay. And we take a look at, in Washington, D.C., at the VOR on the Reagan International Field adjacent to the Pentagon, <coughs> with it within just a mile or two of the Pentagon. This particular VOR has a um, projection out to a DME fix called Pawkey out here, and it is along the line of 246 degrees. Incidentally, this pointer from this label is exactly aligned with that 246 degree direction on the map and this designation on the map. Now, it is a kind of amazing coincidence that the first three digits of the serial number, 246 for American Airlines Flight 77, matches this very same configuration as did the 223 match the serial number in this configuration here at the very navigational aid that is most adjacent to the attack site. And these are the lead aircraft in both occurrences. So are you saying then that this, these planes were handpicked before because of their numbers? Yes. Yes. And this ties into what you said earlier during this interview, secret information that is out, actually out there in the public, but the public doesn't realize that it's well, there is a significance there, or meaning. There are, there are people in the public that are in the know, but there are a very, very small circle of people who are in the know. It is interesting to note that American Airlines, because of its financial condition, was in in uh, uh, receivership, I believe, and the two aircraft that they own that were involved with this were not owned by American Airlines. They were owned by banks out of Wilmington, Delaware. Namely, First Union National Bank owned Flight A11, and uh, American Airlines Flight 77 was owned by Wilmington Trust. And those aircraft were not in the lineup for those flights on those days. They were transposed in that position at the last minute. They were not. They were not scheduled. The flight. Uh, those scheduled. Those pl flights were not scheduled with those airplanes. Is that what you're saying? On that day. On that day. Until, until the last minute. Well, how did the uh, how did the banks have to do with that? The, the Wilmington Trust and so forth. Uh, that's an interesting question, and, and would sir, seriously consider as an investigation. Do you, you have any thoughts on that? I, it would only be speculative at this point, uh, but I'm, I'm sure that there is infiltration of this Skull and Bones organization and within the financial structure of our country. Uh, their utilization of these aircraft uh, is no accident. Uh, uh, ownership of these by parties who may be involved with the Skull and Bones organization is probably not a happenstance. Certainly the trading activity for American Airlines and United Air Airlines prior to the few days prior to the attack were indications that there were people in the banking institutions who knew this was going to happen and trading on put options on these aircraft or these airlines was at an all time high. high. Yes. I, th I think I saw a figure once where it was like nine times high above the normal. I'm not I'm aware of that, but I know that it was out of the normal range. Yes, on, on I think uh, not only American, but also United. Both. Both. 
Yes. So and there were people that had to know about this in advance. That's right. And then certainly there are people who are much more knowledgeable about that aspect of it than I am. Well, now, would the fact that, uh, that these two airplanes, by America, uh, American Airlines airplanes, were owned by a bank and not by American Airlines be significant because uh, each airline, each airplane, I understand, if you incorporate each airline singly rather than incorporate them as part of a large corporation with, say, 50 airplanes, if that plane goes down, the company doesn't go bankrupt. They just can sue for that one plane. That is a financial technical question that you'd have to address another uh, expert. I'm not able to address that. But could that be the reason that they are with the bank? These pl airplanes are with the, the two different banks? It's interesting that they both have the same address on Rodney Square in Wilmington, Delaware, in the same building. Speculation again if we do anything beyond that. Yeah, obviously, a small group of people within those two banks we're, were in the know. We're in the know, right. Okay. And the choice of those aircraft were under their supervision. Okay. Let's jump to LaGuardia Airport. And the LaGuardia, LaGuardia VOR that I mentioned just in that previous slide, uh, once again, just bounce back to the uh, previous slide. To, this is the LaGuardia VOR, which is adjacent to the World Trade Center. If you take a close-up view of it, that remember it looks like a uh, like a, a hat uh, kind of structure. LaGuardia VOR is, is placed out on pilings out over water, and at the end of runway 22 uh, at uh, LaGuardia Airport is actually built out over the water. So this actually looks sort of like a an aircraft carrier deck <laughs> when you look down on it. And you've got this VOR station very peculiar, peculiarly placed out in the water. This is not the usual kind of uh, placement of a VOR station. I have indicated here that you know there are two different directions that aviation operations correspond to. The true north uh, that goes straight to the North Pole as well as the magnetic north which the compass settings are aligned to. Runways are designated based on their magnetic heading by the first two digits. For instance, uh, runway 22 is roughly aligned along a line of uh, 220 degrees. Interestingly, if you measure along the magnetic heading of this runway, that magnetic heading is 223 degrees. <laughs> Okay, so we have, again, the reoccurrence of uh, the value 223 and the serial number of the aircraft, the jet airway assigned to the navigational aid of this very navigational station, and uh, as well as the uh, model number of the 767 that was used in that, that particular attack, and uh, that first attack in the World Trade Center. All right, let's just focus on that one attack and go through that to give you an idea of how this all strings together, starting at the Statue of Liberty and LaGuardia of the OR. If you recall, <clears throat> the Skull and Bones line runs directly over the head of the Statue of Liberty, and these are the heading in the northern and southern direction from that point. Here is the LaGuardia VOR relative to where the location of the Statue of Liberty is in the greater New York area. Okay, this is the exact placement of uh, longitude and, uh, latitude and longitude of, of this particular LaGuardia VOR station adjacent to the runway. And to give you an idea of the precision of this, when you take a look at uh, a measurement on the Earth's surface of, of degrees, minutes, and seconds. Uh, one second on the Earth's surface is uh, about 100 feet long. So when you come down to a positioning of 1.4, you, 
you are coming down to a precision of a, in the tens of feet of accuracy. So we're, we're, we're quite, and this is a, an FAA published value on, on the map. So, uh, and, and with the FAA's listed um, information for this uh, particular navigational aid. So I'm using the FAA's own information. If the VOR stations are primarily used for in route or from cross country, from airport to airport or station to station um, in air utility. They can be used for approaches to uh, landings and uh, are the VOR method of uh, instrument guidance to a landing is the least accurate of those that are offered. The instrument landing system with a localizer and glide slope is, is standard with a higher degree of precision and now they're coming into uh, use of microwave landing systems that are very accurate. But they, in some applications, in, in, uh, especially in smaller airports and in remote areas, uh, VOR approaches to landing uh, can be employed. But uh, if you wanted to utilize this as a uh, even for a, an instrument, instrument approach to this, this runway, I have shaded in the area along which you could have placed this VOR station, including jumping across the bay to uh, a location of, uh, a mile or two to the north, and, and placed that very same station and had the same degree of precision and utility, but yet they have chosen to put it right out here in the water, okay? So we have very peculiar placement based on its utility, okay? One of the things that are offered by the FAA to pilots is what is called NOTAMs, or Notice to Airmen. NOTAMs are required for the pilot to review uh, prior to the flight planning to understand that if there has been any changes in navigational station operations, they are to be responsible for knowing that before departure. And so notice to airmen or NOTAMs are standard uh, FAA uh, literature and they're reviewed and updated uh, uh, very frequently. It is interesting to note uh, that most VOR stations do have some uh, limitations based on obstructions in the area and it's not unusual for an, a VOR station to have a limitation in its use on two or three or four uh, directions from the station. But the LaGuardia VOR has 32, 32 specific indications where it is not to be used or relied upon for any kind of, of reasonable uh, precision and it is so bad in its placement that it has 32 qualifications for not using <laughs> the station. <laughs> Each one of these that I have listed here are separate listings of specific uh, points along the, uh, the radius of the station where it is not to be used. Why? Because, Why? because uh, the signal is being interfered with by some obstruction and the pilot will be get, getting erroneous information. Why are they doing that? Well, why did they place it here? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously they didn't consider uh, optimal performance in their selection. And when they uh, go through the planning process, they know they're going to encounter this kind of problem before they construct it, based on their understanding of the line of sight of radio waves and the actual surrounding conditions. So they have chosen the absolute worst possible location of this in terms of its performance. But yet, in the 1950s, when they placed this, this is where they chose to place it. So why? There, there's other reasons why. You'll well, that's what I'm asking you. We'll see. You're going to show us? Yes. By the way, going back to the map that's no longer available, why is that map no longer available? you have some thoughts on that? Because it has information that they don't want us to realize. What kind of information? Indications that plannings of attacks are actually specified on the maps. In the future? In the past. In the past? Okay. And in the future, probably. 
Okay. Obviously, with the indications of the matching of the serial numbers with specific radio navigational aids adjacent to attack sites was past information that they had published on their maps. Okay? And, and they don't want anybody like you figuring it out in the future. Well, or figuring it out in the past. <laughs> or figure it out. Too late for that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, let's jump to when. Okay, when are we going to attack? If we take when a, are we going to attack? Or when are they going to attack? I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. No, watch, your, watch your language there. Yes. Well, I'm, uh, I have to You've I'm been doing very well. I'm mad well, you're pretty tired by now. Okay, well, I'm okay. Okay. If we take a, a, a step backwards and look at the, the location of LaGuardia VOR adjacent to the runway, and this is where the Skull and Bones line runs adjacent to it. It's not exactly on it, but it's adjacent to it. This line that I have here, white line, projects away from the Statue of Liberty. They both intersect the Statue of Liberty back down, uh, down the road. Okay. Now, when we take a look at the point at which this line, this white line, and this yellow line, the Skull and Bones line, are equidistant from the Statue of Liberty, and we draw a line from the center of the station across to that intersection of equal distance on the skull and bones line, we develop this vector or this uh, arrow here that goes off in a direction of 320.95 degrees. And that will become very important later on to pay attention to. But the other interesting thing is that the distance between these two lines happens to coincide with one of those magical coding values, namely base E. If you take base E and divide it by 10, you have the number of mileage distance between these two lines right here. Furthermore, when pairing, comparing uh, this gap of uh, 1,434 feet, that is very close to another magical coding value, and that being 1,436. It turns out that in a day, when the Earth goes through one revolution, uh, or 360 degrees, it's not quite a noon to noon day. The Earth actually has to turn 320 plus a little bit more each day to come from noon to noon. And that's because we're advancing in the orbit and it has to compensate. So for the Earth to make a 360 degree turn, that's called a sidereal day, not a standard day, a sidereal day. And that particular day is 1,436 minutes long, okay? That gap is very close to a sidereal day in minutes. A standard day is 1,440 minutes from noon to noon. So this four minute difference is, is something that we have a, a little bit of a gap that occurs every day. So we've matched two coding values from their mathematical coding structure to that particular vector. All right. Now, if we take a look at LaGuardia VOR, it has a frequency that it is specifying. All right. To tune in to this particular radio, you would tune into 113.1 megahertz. Well. This is very interesting that it's 113.1 because if you take the day of the African bombings of, in Kenya and Tanzania to the day of the attacks on 9-11 is 1,131 days. So if you take this frequency value and multiply it by 10, you have the number of days between the African embassy uh, bombings to the morning of the 9-11 tax. So the choice of frequency, which was designated 50 years ago when they put in this VOR, was placed and utilized during the planning for the attack. All right. Now, when you consider that the distance, let me back up, to two previous slides. Forgive me for 
this equidistant length along here to back to the Statue of Liberty, and from this point, which is equidistant back to the Statue of Liberty, is exactly 11.312127 miles. Okay? That happens to be down to the second, expressed as if you t take this value and express it in terms of days, you would have exactly the number of the, uh, days expressed in a decimal expression down to the second from the 2.40 a.m. time when the African bombings attacks, that's Eastern Standard Time, happened in 1998, to the impact of Flight 11 on the North Tower to the second. Okay, that kind of precision to accomplish could not have been accomplished by by accident and by pilots who are so poorly competent, okay, as were the case with allegedly if who there was, were pilots there. Yes. Okay. So, taking things in terms of distances, frequencies, and transposing them into times is a way of recognizing how they're using the code. All right. We have who is involved. We have signatures that they have, just like leaving fingerprints at the, uh, at the scene of the crime, these people left the f uh, fingerprints before they left, actually committed the crime. We have the Masons and the Skull and Bones have left their signature. A big one is by George Herbert Walker Bush, the, the first Bush president, and L. C. I. Ada, and we'll go into detail on each case. Let's first look at the, the confined signature of the Masons and the Skull and Bones. If you look at the uh, New York City area <coughs> and you take and draw a 90 degree angle relative to the Skull and Bones line along an angle of 322 degrees, which uh, again is the coding value for uh, Skull and Bones, you have a intercept at St. Mary's Park and St. John's University. Okay, both of these are very uh, evident in Knights Templar and Masonic uh, ritual. Uh, and those, the, at least we know that the uh, St. John's College was placed at this location in 1870. So the planning for locations for this overall geometry in the the New York, Greater New York City area has been evident ever since uh, uh, their imprint on this over a long period of time. Um, we have also that same 322 degree angle runs right through the VOR station in question. Okay, and then we have much more to do here, and I'm wondering if we should take a break. This may be a good time to take a break, and we'll go into the signature for George Herbert Walker Bush. Okay? okay. And continue this tomorrow. I mean, let's finish this up, and then continue on that same tape right. right. tomorrow. Right. Okay. Part okay. two. Okay. And my butt is sore. <laughs> okay. You know, wiggling yeah. around? Yeah, I, I've been wiggling around, too. Uh, we're back. Ted Gunderson here. February the 9th, 2006. Continuation of my interview with Bob Fisher. Bob, we're back on camera. All right. And thanks for a great presentation the first two hours. Well, it, it's uh, starting to scratch the surface, I hope. <laughs> well, we're into another interesting topic here, George Herbert Walker Bush. Yeah, we began uh, or left off at the tail end of our discussion with uh, people who leave their signatures at the scene of the crime. And now uh, we'll go ahead and, and look at his signature that he, he planted there in, well in advance. Now, which crime is this now? 9-11. 9-11, okay. All right, so 
Recalling that the number 223 seems to be a very important factor in the 9-11 planning, if we take a, a, a step back uh, up into space and look at things on a bigger view and go up here into Maine, this is where the location of Kennebunkport, Maine is. And we have a, a famous president who resides there, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Ex-president. Ex-president. And uh, he uh, happens to have a uh, uh, VOR in his neighborhood, the Kennebunk VOR Vortac, which it means it's a combination of uh, the uh, uh, civilian and the military combined and uh, the station is just adjacent to where he lives. Uh, just a minute. Uh, we, talk, we talked about VORs earlier, of course, in the last interview. Mm -hmm. Explain to the layman what VOR is. Okay. VORs are, are a way in which um, aviation um, systems set up to uh, provide pilots with uh, directional navigation uh, in a way that they know where they are along a line of sight from a given station. Uh, according to a compass direction. And uh, these are stationed uh, or placed all around the United States and uh, provide <coughs> waypoints for uh, highways in the sky. And you mentioned in the uh, other interview about when they go from one area to another, that's what you were talking about, right? Right. Okay. And, and here... Um, it's like, uh, it's like uh, the, the, do they radio down to the operator is something automatic. It's automatic. It's uh, it, these are transmitters, and the the uh, pilot has a receiver in the cockpit that picks up the signal, which has uh, a differential signal according to where they are in a compass direction from the station, so that they can determine where they are. So it's like a road map. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, as you recall in earlier segments uh, that we were uh, encountering the number 223 and the uh, serial numbers of uh, American Airlines Flight 11, uh, the uh, particular jet air route that emanates from LaGuardia VOR, that being Jet Route 223 here. And um, when we take a look at the relationship of Kenny Bunk uh, Vortac in George Herbert Walker Bush's backyard, it happens to be along a 223 degree um, heading to the LaGuardia VOR, okay? Now, uh, the chances of this are uh, being a, a just a happenstance uh, is an impossibility, okay? This is totally impossible for it to be a random chance. Furthermore, <coughs> when you take a look at um, a, uh, another landmark that we discussed earlier, that uh, DME fix cords where the pilots will call in and indicate the, the flight controllers that they've passed this particular waypoint as a way of managing traffic control. Um, we can take a look at a related line or a point along this line with uh, a, a certain degree of interest. You recall that when we were looking at the distance along the line from the Statue of Liberty to the, the VOR station and from the Statue of Liberty along the, the uh, Skull and Bones line, at a certain point, you're at the exact distance that corresponds to the exact time and days of the event, uh, the time from the African bombings of the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, up into uh, the first impact of Flight 11 into the, the, the North Tower, namely, uh, they're at this particular point along both those lines are equidistance at 11.312 uh, 128 miles. That happens to be if you trans, uh, transpose this decimal point to 1131.2128 that is the number of days down to the second at which you have that time span between the African bombings and um, Flight 11's impact in the first tower so down to an exact second. Here is that line coming down from Kennebunk Vortac down to the LaGuardia station. 
And recall I mentioned earlier that there would be some significant interest in this 320.9 degree line where we have a point coming from the VOR station to that equidistant point on the skull and bones line. Well, the interest is, in, is this. If we follow that same line at 320.9 degrees out to where it intersects with that line that runs from Cunningbunk down to towards the cords of DME fix that we mentioned earlier, there is a location along this line near to Monticello, New York, which is equidistant along both of these lines. In other words, we've got two sets of equidistant um, lengths determined by the same line. This 320 degree, uh, 0.9 degree line is the only place along an equidistant point from the Kennebunk vortex. If you notice that this would be, this arc is an equidistant length from the, the vortex. Now, this 320.9 degree line intersects exactly along um, the uh, arc where both of these vectors intersect in an equidistant arc. And once again, when we take a look down at the Statue of Liberty, the skull and bones line and the line to the vortex are both terminated at the very same line. So we have two circumstances where we have defined equidistances from an attack source and from the source of the author as equidistant lines, okay, determined by one line, okay. So uh, there again we have a mathematical relationship that is pretty hard and fast and um, not too uh, randomly uh, uh, possible. So we have a whole series of relationships of, of uh, these uh, quaint relationships between uh, the, the uh, Kennebunk Vortac and uh, the Jet Route 223 and the, the airliner that has the serial number 223 and, and so on. And as we take a look at um, the reoccurrence of, of these various things, um, for all these things to come together is a, an impossibility to not have a design behind it. And the people who are involved with this um, essentially are providing two important um, concepts to be uh, reckoned with. Okay, first, there exists a signature reflecting their strategic modus operandi over a long period of time. The global surface shell and the aeronautical shell, <coughs> there is an architectural design evident that they've imposed, just as the seal of Astaroff in Washington, D.C. was very uh, meticulously arranged. These arrangements of the VOR stations in our aeronautical aviation system are very strategic, strategically arranged to correspond to this, these geometries that I have indicated. Furthermore, these ge geometric configurations pertain to the attack on 9-11. So when you consider the fact that the placement of these VORs, these uh, heading relationships, and the frequencies that are assigned to stations date back to the 1950s, there has been a very long-range plan at work here. So on a strategic level, they have left uh, their signature over a long period of time, which indicates that there are um, various offices within the FAA and the Department of Defense that have been working together to assure that this skull and bones, uh, how should I say, itinerary has been firmly built up over time. 
So we have a, um, a body of, of people who have, uh, have had the responsibility to assure that this configuration would remain within the Federal Aviation Administration's purview and under their control all over a long period of time. Furthermore, <coughs> there exists a, a signature of the tactical level in the months leading up to the attack indicating that they're taking specific aircraft with specific um, serial numbers and corresponding them to specific navigational aids in the Federal Aviation Airway System. That kind of tactical arrangement is evidence to the depth at which they are going to to arrange these tax attacks and mark them with their signature. Okay. It would be interesting to learn when uh, the Bush family bought the Kennecott property, wouldn't it? Uh, it would be interesting to know uh, who made yeah, the decision to put the VOR in their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and but it, and, they, and, and when, not only that, but uh, maybe he bought a say on uh, February the 22nd of uh, some yeah, year. So, yeah, it could be. Yeah, if we look back, there could be some uh, interesting little quaint uh, relationship in, in terms of that. Yeah, they probably uh, put the VOR in there after he bought it, don't you think? Yes, I'm sure that the family property was was there well in advance of the VOR, yeah. but the assignment of the VOR to that location uh, certainly had to be approved by the FAA. Uh, it had to be approved by uh, not just the FAA, the DOD, and the Department of Defense. Right, because they work together hand in hand. Nothing happens in the FAA without the DOD's blessing. So there are people in offices throughout this period of time who have been in charge of the. Uh, charting and the placement of navigational aids, the assignment of frequencies to these uh, navigational aids that were later used in the attacks on 9-11. And that planning has been uh, taking place for a very long time. You say since at least the early 1950s? Then when the VORs started to be placed into the system, yes. Yes. So um, if we take a look at another uh, cast of characters. We were told that Al Qaeda was the uh, culprit involved, but in fact, as others have indicated, there is Al Qaeda that has actually been involved because the people who are in involved with the um, Muslim aspect of this perspective have been under the purview of the CIA. And a recognition and a signature of that can be noticed once again by revisiting the passage of the Skull and Bones line past that runway where LaGuardia VOR is. Just across the, the, this little water gap where the Skull and Bones line runs through, along a 322 degree angle, you run right over the Rikers Island high security penitentiary where we have, among other people, the blind Sheikh, who was responsible for the 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. Having residence here um, is not just a matter of, of uh, incarceration and, and, and uh, uh, penal consideration. It is also a consideration of a signature for a future attack. Okay, on February 26, 1993, there was an attack on day 892.4, blah, 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 uh, in that respective 1,440-day cycle. They are operating in 1,440-day cycles. It happened that the 9-11 attack happened on the 11, 1,131st day of the, that respective cycle. A previous cycle was involved with the earlier attack in 1993, and it occurred on the 892nd day of that particular cycle. Okay, this left a residual from 1,440 of five, 547.5987 days in that cycle. Once again, we match that 
very closely to one of the magic uh, coding values that are, are used in the coding structure and having the digital sequence 547.3561 and uh, the significance of, of that in terms of its, its um, a background can be uh, uh, introduced later, uh, but it, the matching here is a very close precision, 0.0443% variation from it. And if you take that and consider that there are 1,440 minutes in a day and you were to look at a 24-hour clock phase and to transform that, that value of, of, of um, 547 out of the 1,440 swing of the arc, that would bring you to 223 degrees on the dial. <laughs> okay, once again, a reaffirmation of the involvement of 223 in the overall scope. Okay. Do you have any idea why it's 223? Uh, that I am not certain. Or is a secret uh, it, it, message? Subliminal so message is concerned. I think it's probably a pin number. It's it's sort of like you know we go and plug a pin number in to get into the ATM machine, and the the pin number for this attack is 223. Gotcha. Okay, that's my best uh, evaluation of that at this point. There are probably better evaluations if uh, we uncover more information. So if we got one of those old maps that they don't uh, make available to the public anymore and start looking for different numbers, maybe we could figure out what's going to happen next. I believe that would be the case. And I that's think why they don't make them available to us. That's right. Do you have any of the old maps? Um, millions of them are out there. And you Do you have any yourself? I have a few myself, but there are millions out there that they cannot recover because too many people have them. Okay, well let's tell everybody to uh, ship a copy of their map to you. Well, or to people who are uh, interested in, in following this line of... Mathematically of, inclined. Yes, this line of investigation, right. So, now we can move on to where is the attack. When you take a look at the very same location, there is a bridge that gun, runs from Rikers Island to shore. And if you take a look at um, two angles that I've kind of uh, bracketed with, one is 26 degrees uh, heading and the other is 27 degrees, and the, the bridge runs right down along a line closer to the 26 degree angle. And my um, feeling about this is that that angle that that bridge was constructed corresponds to a value uh, of phi squared. Now, phi is a value like pi that recurs in nature, and where pi is involved with circular geometry, phi uh, is, pertains to spiral geometry. And it has other mathematical um, uh, qualities that make it very unique as well. The interesting thing is, you may recall that I mentioned the precession cycles earlier. Well, when you take a look at this angle that I'm discussing here at being uh, a 10 times this phi square value of 2.618033987498.9, if you really want to take it out that far. Um, and you multiply that phi square value times 432, you come up with 1131. Once again, the days, number of days between the African embassy attack and the 9-11 attacks. Okay, so there we have the correspondence between the geophysical core value that aligns with or is integrated with these other values that allow this to be a day for uh, this occurrence, okay? So, but in respect to this particular situation, we notice that this is at about a 26.18 degree angle, okay? You could have made that bridge at any angle you would any, uh, possible other than that and still accomplish the same thing. You know, it's, it's all just going to Rikers Island, all right? Now, if you take a look at that same angle, 
and where you had a um, let me find it here. It's it's hard to see here because we've we've got a lot of um, we're stepped back very very far. That angle that of uh, the Rikers Island Bridge, and you draw that from uh, this intersection of this line where, that runs from Fort Schuyler to Peterborough Airport in New Jersey. From um, that point and the intersection with the 322 degree Skull and Bones. Uh, <coughs> um, um, it's not the Skull and Bones line. This is the Skull and Bones line, but this is a vector value corresponding to 322 degrees, which is the Skull and Bones signature. At that intersection, following the same angle as the Riker Island Bridge, <coughs> excuse me, you come down to the Statue of Liberty. So the same angle that is established on the Rikers Island Bridge adjacent to the LaGuardia VOR is the same angle that this Pythagorean relationship defines going down to the Statue of Liberty. So we kind of come full circle there. Now the importance of that <coughs> will become evident here in a, in a moment. Going back to Rikers Island, <coughs> we have these two high security buildings that are in a uh, rectangular shape very near to this 322 degree line. If we draw a line parallel to the Skull and Bones Great Circle line, this big heavy yellow line, parallel to it down southward and just remain parallel with this on down through the New York regional area we come to the footprint of tower number one and tower number two. Okay, so why was there a construction project for the Rikers Island high security prisons to correspond to the same placement of the footprint at the other end of the island for the World Trade Center when it was constructed? Okay, this is a geometry and a uh, architectural design not unlike the considerations that were put into Washington DC with the seal of Astroff. Okay, this is long-term planning <coughs> on the part of the people who constructed the World Trade Center, namely the, um, think of their name, I'm sorry, the Rockefeller brothers, David Rockefeller. Okay, so when they decided where to place the World Trade Center, and whomever made the decisions to make the construction at Rikers Island, there was a mirror image of each other. And who was in Rikers Island on the very day of the attack? The Blind Shake, who was probably involved with organizing some aspect of that attack. Well, he was involved uh, in the 93. He was involved with the 93? 93 and probably involved with 911 to a degree. Well, I'm, I'm sure he could work things from inside. Oh, of course he do. And uh, they have a grapevine in the prison that you can't believe. And prior to the '93 attack, the blind Sheikh was intimately involved with the CIA and CIA operations in Afghanistan. And, and trained by the CIA. And closely associated with Bin Laden. So Absolutely. Al the, the blind Sheikh was the direct communications conduit between the CIA and bin Laden. So here we have another astounding recognition of, of their um, signature. But the, the, the icing on the cake is this. When you take a look at this high altitude <coughs> in route map and look at the designation for the LaGuardia VOR on the map. It has a label that indicates the frequency and uh, it has a, a Morse code that transmits all the time in the, in the letters LGA so that it identifies it to the pilot. And this particular label is, is, has some degree of arbitrary context uh, as to where the map maker or the cartographer decides to place it on the map. 
Well, they have chose to place it on the map and use the pointer from that little balloon label in such a manner that it comes through LaGuardia VOR to the World Trade Center. That same line goes all the way down the East Coast to the Pentagon. That same line is defined by the pointer on this map. And that has always been that way. So this is not something that happened by accident. The people who make the maps, who put the VOR stations in their place, assign their frequencies, that was all controlled. And what year you say? 1950s? It's a, a, been a, a construction project since the 1950s. 1950s. Yes. So we're looking at uh, 50 some, 50 some years, 51 um, years. Yes, and, and it's not just here in the United States, but there's evidence around that the it, world. it's around the world. Because they're in control of the placement of, of these VOR stations and uh, internationally as well. And we're going to cover that in the next uh, session. That's right. So I hope that this has been an enlightening uh, pr presentation and uh, hopefully it'll wake people up to the fact that although this is technical, it is understandable and it is a matter of just taking the time to pay attention to these correlations that cannot be a possible random chance. So you presented it in an outstanding manner, and I think he, uh, all of us laymen can understand it. I hope so. Yes, absolutely. No question. And congratulations. And thank thanks you. very much for coming forward. Thank you. Thanks. God bless you. God bless you. Thanks. Okay. That's it. <laughs>